So, welcome everyone. I would like to introduce myself. I'm Andrea Varga, and I'm from TypeSafe from the ACA team. And I have to start with a confession. I'm actually in a deep trouble starting this presentation. So I know we are a bit in short on time and there are, you all want to see code, but <coughs> you, you have to know the context. So a few months ago, the ACA team came to me and said, OK, Andrea, do you want to hold a presentation at Scala Days? I said, no. They said, OK, there we have it. So I scratched my head and I was thinking all along, how could I make this presentation? And it ended up quite fine. I, I finished it yesterday. And th then a strange software glitch happened, and I lost 12 of my slides. So I needed some advice. So I met my old friend, Jack Daniels, and <laughs> he gave me some good advice. I calmed down, and I managed to restore everything. And I was like, oh, now everything is fine. I have the flow of my presentation. Everything is in my head. And then this strange person comes to me. You probably know him, Jonas Bonner. So he's my boss. And he was like, so Andre, do you have any numbers in your presentation? I mean, like numbers like what, benchmarks? Yeah, yeah, benchmarks. You absolutely have to do that. It has to be the first slide. You have to blow away your, your, your audience. And I was like, OK, what comes next? And I was in deep trouble. How can I introduce these numbers in my presentation? So I just go ahead. And <laughs> yeah, so Jonas is happy and will not fire me anymore, probably. But by the way, he's the very nicest guy in the world, and it's just kind of my way of uh, giving him some uh, nice respect and thanks. <laughs> no, really, I mean, I'm serious here. So um, probably you heard about the Tech Empower benchmarks. It's kind of a series of benchmarks about, uh, well, web frameworks. And uh, the Spray guys, we are lucky. We have Johannes here uh, among the audience. He's one of the Spray members. Uh, well, they do a um, web framework uh, based on ACA. And actually, it happened to be that the ACA IO layer is kind of the child of the ACA team and the Spray team. We all work together, and we put everything together. Um, so um, it's like uh, they did a, a little benchmark, and they submitted it. And these are the results. So while we don't have direct numbers on the ACA layer's uh, scalability and uh, performance, we have implicitly kind of uh, validated our approach by uh, Spray beating many of the other frameworks. This is uh, the numbers from uh, EC2 and JSON parsing, and this is from dedicated hardware. So, let, okay, you are all blown away. So now we can proceed. I... I don't like showing that much code. I know you're all hardcore developers here and you want to see the code as immediately as possible, but I'm more like the pilot, you know, that approaches the runway from a long angle and, and yeah, I want to tell a story. So let's start with the groundwork. What is I.O.? It's nothing more than just communicating with an external system from an information processing system. That's it. All fine. So. Let's go one step ahead. So IO is always about protocols. A protocol is always a set of messages and a script that drives at certain points in time and in certain states what kind of messages a system can produce and what kind of messages it accepts and consumes. This is very important because we want to design an API and since we want to have an IO layer, which is basically mostly about networking, we want to have an abstraction that really fits well with protocols. Also, it's a bit less understood, but IO is also about juggling reads and writes. Since we have two systems, they are independent. So it can always happen that you have stuff to send, but the other guy is not able to keep up. The other node, the other entity is just too slow. Either it has not enough processing power, or the bandwidth uh, among the communication channel that exists between the two entities is just too narrow, then you have to handle the case when you are faster than the receiver. The other problem is that, well, the other entity is completely independent. He can decide at any time that he wants to send you a message. It's an event for you. You have to handle that event 
for some, in some way. So, we know what is I.O. about, and we have a goal now. We want to design an API layer for I.O. that is expressive enough for our purposes, but we don't want to compromise. We really want to expose the protocol that is under you, since this is a low-level API. If you provide an abstraction, you always give a compromise. Well, any abstraction is kind of a lowest common denominator, so um, it's absolutely domain dependent. So we don't want to abstract things away, we want to expose things, and then you can put your own abstraction on top of it, but then you decide on your own assumptions on your own. A protocol, there are different protocols because, well, they have different services. You want to use them, right? So let's start designing an API. Start with synchronous calls. So what is a synchronous call? It's, everybody knows it implicitly, but it's about calling something and then, well, my thread or, or execution context doesn't progress until that call has been finished. So let's take a look. How could a synchronous write look like? Well, we have a little dummy code here. It's a loop. It checks if we have things to send. And if we have something, we just take it and write it to the output channel. This call write blocks. It waits until the writing actually happened, and then it returns. It's very nice, since the write can suspend our sending of the next message until the receiver is actually ready to receive that message. So we have an implicit flow control here. Unfortunately, we had to sacrifice a thread. Every time you block, the thread is out of order. It's that cannot do anything until it is awakened and get up again. So, it's a choice. You want to block, you need to sacrifice a thread. Okay, so let's see reads. It's not much different. We actually go and call read on the channel, which blocks us until something actually comes in. And then we progress, we handle that stuff, and then we start again, we block problem is the same, we have to sacrifice a thread. And then the tricky question. So now I'm blocking an upright, and an external event comes in. How do I handle that? So if you really want to go the blocking way, in your driving thread, you have to anticipate external events at certain points in time. So you have to, in some way, interleave writes and reads, and it's really nasty. It may work, under certain cases, I will revisit this until the next slide. So, blocking API is dangerous. Dangerous on many levels. First of all, it seems conceptually simple. You just do the write, and when it returns, it's ready. You just do the read, and when something is available, it returns, and you get the value. It seems nice, except that you cannot really immediately react to, to things that happen. And the other thing was that we always sacrifice a thread. And threads, well, it's a bold statement that threads doesn't scale, but the thing is that you cannot have arbitrary amount of threads. So you want to have a limited resource, a thread pool. And if you have a thread pool and everyone blocks on it, then nobody progresses, no stuff gets ever done. So there's a misconception here about the ACA team. It's people think that we hate blocking. We actually don't. We just avoid it for several reasons, but we don't hate it. I mean, like, you are blocking coal, and, well, we can have beer any time. So it's no problem. We are not hostile to blocking. But, okay, apart from joking, if you have a very simple client-side software that just sends something, a request, and then waits for a reply, go with blocking. You don't have to think about scale. But for us, it was our design decision that we wanted to have a system that scales. So let's say goodbye to the blocking APIs. And proceed to our next venture, asynchronous calls. So asynchronous calls differ from synchronous calls in a very, very important way. An asynchronous call returns before the actual service we wanted to invoke finishes. 
So in the case of write, when we call write, the method will return before it actually happened. So let's see how can we have an asynchronous API bit of write. So we have this output channel, we call write, and yeah, we, we would like to be notified that when it's finished. So let's have a callback, right? Okay, but what should I do inside the callback? Really, I have a lot of data to send. I need to repeat this. The callbacks doesn't really work here. And also, I have to be careful not to over overload the receiver. Tricky question. Futures do help here? Who thinks futures help here? Please raise your hand. Actually, no. So, uh, no, no, I mean, yeah, that was a tricky question. Sorry for that. But, I mean, futures are about transforming values. So basically, you just instruct something to produce a value eventually, and you set the rails, the tracks, where the data will travel along and, and uh, go through several transformations. But it's not data that we want here. We want a synchronizer. We want a signal. that The write has been finished. So we have to admit callbacks are a mess. So we don't go the callback way. Another question, would iterities help here? Yes, of course, but sorry, I don't have time to go into the depth of iterities. So they are really nice and basically say thanks to the play guys so they implemented back pressure inside iterities and you don't even have to know about that. So really, say, say thanks to the play guys. And also, another problem is that iterative, again, is a higher level abstraction. We, want, we don't want to introduce it yet. We can build something on top of a low-level API later, but we want to have a nice, flexible, low-level API. So, that was a lot of hand-waving and lies and lies and stuff. <laughs> uh, but in the actual world, of course, there are asynchronous APIs, right? And one of them are selectors. Selectors is basically, even if you go in low-level languages, is the most common way of dealing with asynchronous I.O. And of course, it's the lowest possible level of abstraction on the JVM if you don't go uh, through native calls. I don't know how much of you know about selectors. Please raise your hand if you ever use selectors. Quite a lot. Thank you. So selectors are kind of a hybrid. Selectors have channels, and you can block with a select call, and you wake up from that block when events come in. But it can be multiple events. The thing, the trick is that you only sacrifice one thread. But once you have the event, you are free to pass that along for pro uh, processing to several other threads. So dispatching of that event can be completely asynchronous, and we just have this one thread, and we carefully manage it for blocking. We cannot do it any other way, but it works nice. <coughs> of course, we don't want to have infinite number of threads, so we usually dispatch to a thread pool. It basically works like this. So you have one thread on the top. It's a selecting thread. And it waits where you see the dash line, it basically waits for events. And where you see the gray boxes, it does the dispatch magic, which is very fast. And it hands over the thing to the other threads to process. It's not the only architecture, by the way, with thread pools and selectors. There are other frameworks who use slightly different uh, approaches. But this is the model we will uh, use here. But anyway, anyone who ever used selectors um, I think they will all agree that they are hard to use. They are not a really good way of abstraction. So let's use actors. That's what my presentation is about. And we at the ACA team, we dream about actors, electric sheep, and yeah, we really want to show you how nice <laughs> actors can be. So how many people don't know about actors? Please raise your hand now. Ah, no, that's too few, so sorry, I skipped this slide. Um, no, really, I mean, uh, yeah, we have a limited time here. So actors are a natural fit for asynchronous API. There is this buzzword nowadays being reactive. Reactive basically means that you do things when events happen. 
you react to events. It's, I simplify things here, but this is the essence. And actors always react to messages, which are events. An actor don't do things by himself, except if he sends him itself a message. Of course, that works. But otherwise, it always reacts to events. If you remember that callback example, which was a dummy example at the right, the main problem was that all of our, our code paths are messed up. And with actors, it doesn't happen. Because it's not like a thread, or like a stream of script, what will happen, but it's like handlers on, on, on specific messages. And basically, actors like a little process with a queue. So events if, can just queue up if you are not yet ready to process that because you are still processing some other one. Actors are also very natural for expressing protocols. Why? Because every actor is all about message passing. And we had those very, very first slides that protocols are about a script and a set of defined messages. And it's the same with actors. Very nice. So that's why we created the Aka IO layer. It was developed in collaboration with the Spray team. They are really, really nice guys. So if you have advanced questions, go to Johannes, not to me, because I'm, I'm, I'm not that good as they are. But anyway, uh, it was a very nice collaboration. The basic idea was, during the, uh, the, the design of the API, we all had experiences with other abstractions. We all had our other tries, experience, experiments to, to, to work with uh, networking and uh, IO. And then we just sat together and decided that actors are a natural abstraction for a network channel. No handles, no IDs. It will be an actor. You will see it shortly. The IO layer, of course, uses selectors in the background. There is no other way to do it. But it hides you from all the threading issues and manage, managing the blocking, which you have to do because you have to sacrifice at least one thread to do a blocking select. So the goals were, apart from a nice API, is also to scale. So we wanted to handle millions of connections. We don't know if that will work out or not yet, but yeah. So the benchmarks show that um, it's really working out well. We really want to have maximum throughput and of course low latency as well. But again, I have to repeat, we don't want to make the mistake here that we abstract away important services from the lower layer protocols. That's another layer on top of this API. So yeah, this was a nice little journey. We went through um, all these uh, hassles. And now I can show you some example. It will be a very simple one. It's just to have a feel how this API works. And of course, it's the UDP protocol. That's my favorite. I really love UDP. It's the ultimate protocol. And also, it fits on this slide. And I like the UDP <laughs> protocol. So, but now, now think about it. I, I don't know how many APIs you use for UDP, but just imagine that you want to send out heartbeats to a monitoring system. Of course, you don't want to open a TCP connection for that. UDP is just right for that. You just send a datagram every one second or so. So you don't even want to listen on a port. You just want to fire a message, and it just travels around. There are really no uh, convenient APIs for that, but we have it. So how does this work? So first of all, there is this IO extension. It's an ECHA extension, but with just kind of a magic incantation. So you say, I want the UDP uh, API. This is an actor. Everything is an actor. You send him a message. He just says, I want a UDP channel, a simple sender channel, which will do nothing, just give me something that I can use for sending messages. And of course, I have the heart of the actor, the receive block, which only does one thing here. It just wait until we, come, we, we get an acknowledgment that the simple sender is ready. And actually, the sender reference, so the actor that replies to us, is the channel actor that we can use. So all we do now is just we change our state. It's context.become. It's like a state machine transition. So basically, this will be our new receive block. 
which does a very simple thing. If we have a string message, uh, we will create a byte string of it and send it to this channel actor. And it will travel all through the wire. That's it. And of course, we need an address, but you can change it anytime you want. There is no fixed address, it's just a datagram. We set the data, the address, send it, fire and forget, and it works. It's very similar if you want to listen to UDP datagrams. You again do the magical incantation and get the manager, the entry point for the API, through this ACA extension. You say IUDP and send him a bind message. A bind message has two important parameters. One is who will listen to the incoming events. In this case, it's self. So the actor, which I omitted the actor boilerplate in the beginning and the end. So he will handle all the incoming events. There is one event we must handle before we can do anything else. It's just the acknowledgement from this uh, API that the binding was successful. We are bound now. And that's it. We again record the sender. He will represent, represent our channel. And we become ready. And whenever we receive a UDP datagram, we have the data and the remote address. And we can handle it. As simple as that. So the API has a very basic architecture. For every kind of protocol, there is an entity called manager, who is the entry point. We always ask that actor for getting a certain channel. It can be a TCP listening channel, or an outbound connection, or as we saw, a UDP simple sender, or you can bind to a UDP port, and stuff like that. And then you get back an answer, and the sender of that message is the channel actor that you will use for communicating with other systems. That's it. And usually, if you want to listen for external event, which we wouldn't uh, want it to do at the simple sender case, then you also have to pass another actor reference, the actor that will receive the incoming event. That's it. So, we so saw now how the ACA API looks like, sort of. We have a feel of it. We went through the hassle of seeing how API design could go on. And we also had a peek at selectors. So let's see how all these things fit together. So do you remember? Selectors are hybrid. We sacrifice a thread, thread that will do the blocking and wait on events, and then we dispatch to a preferably a worker pool. Well, in your case, you have no problem with blocking, because that's the ACA IO layer's responsibility. It will do the blocking. On the dispatching side, on the other hand, we have a nice trick available. Basically, all actors run on, well, a glorified thread pool. We call them dispatchers, and they have a little bit more services. But it's like a thread pool. But you don't have to handle any kind of threading. They are normal actors. So this dispatching to these actors is implicitly works like dispatching to a worker pool. But it's all hidden. And this is how it looks like internally. So you have the IO extension, which is an ACA extension, which we, you use to get to the protocol API you want to. It has this manager, one actor that is the entry point. You always get the, uh, that guy's reference if you uh, call the IO extension. And there comes the interesting part. This have several child actors called selection handlers. They are the actors responsible for doing the select and managing the blocking. And they, are, uh, they receive registrations. So when a new channel actor is created and a channel is opened in the background, it gets registered to one of the selection handlers. It doesn't have to be one. You can have as many selectors as you configure it to have. And you can also limit the number of channels each selection handler will accept. So if you know how to fine-tune your system, you can basically fine-tune how many selectors you will stripe uh, the I.O. on, and you can limit easily the inbound or outbound channels on a selector. Well, basically, when, you, uh, when the manager tries to, to register to one of these selection handlers, it, uh, it tries to find one available. And if it can't, it fails. But it will not block any other. Uh, IO progress. 
And the selection handlers have as their children the actors representing the channels, the kind of worker actors. I more like to call them channel actors. They are the people we send messages to. And there are other interesting stuff, but it's important that the channel actors communicate with the selectors. They register interests and they receive events. So this is how the dispatching magic works in the background. They register like a, a read interest. I, I want to receive a read event, so an external uh, entity sends something to me. And then it gets notified when it happened, and then it can progress actually extracting the data, processing the data, wrapping it in a message, and sending to the user. All fine, all good, but we remember that callback right example, right? It was messy. And the messiness came partly from the fact that we have to implement flow control or other people like to call it back pressure, but it's the same idea. We want to limit the rate between the receiver and the sender. And we, all what we have seen yet is just sending messages to actors. No one limits us in any way. So actually, the Aka IO layer have two models of back pressure. One is the ACK-based one. It's a very simple protocol between the channel actor and the user actor that uses that guy. We always send a write command, so send something out to the network, and we cannot send the next write until an acknowledgement came to us that it actually finished. So it's a simple alternating protocol, except that there is a little trick. I sent out a write, and another layer, another top-level service asks me to write again, but I haven't got the acknowledgement yet. I have to buffer. And this is the price of any asynchronous I.O. Back pressure is no longer implicit, like in blocking, when it basically infects the whole call chain, and everyone gets blocked. But we pray, pay with threads uh, for this conceptual simplicity. But here, you have to handle it directly. But it gives you more tools, like you can drop messages, which is impossible if you do blocking. So here is a very dummy example how you can handle this. So from the top layer, we receive a send it message. It's just an instruction that please send out this data. We store it in a buffer, and we send a write to the actor responsible for the channel, the connection actor. And then we have to change our state. Since now we in the state we sent out the write, and now we cannot write, we want to receive an act first. So that's why we use context become, and we just use an inline function here. And it basically does the, uh, a very simple thing. If we again receive something from the higher layer, we buffer it. And if we have an acknowledgement, we start serving from the buffer if it's not empty. And of course, if the peer has closed, we can just stop the actor itself. There is another model. It's the neck-based one. It's a more complex thing. So in the previous example, we all saw that for any write, we actually have two message sends, a write and then the act which comes back. We want to spare some of the messages. So another idea is that we write, and eventually, if it does not succeed, the, the sender is overload, uh, the channel actor is overloaded, it will reply with a negative acknowledgement. In this case, it will be a common failed message, which contains the last successful, uh, last uns first unsuccessful write. But there is a slight race here. So we had two successful writes, and the channel actor responds with a command failed, but we haven't received yet at those times when we send those other two writes out, and they get lost. So in this case, the sender has to keep track of the pending writes, and it has to be able to recover from that. That's why the command failed actually contains the first failed write. So you can include additional metadata in your write, like a sequence number, so you can have a window of your messages, and then you can replay all those failed writes. But first, you have to ask for resume writing, 
And you will get notified with the writing resumed after the channel actor is ready to receive writes again. So as we have seen, this is way more complex than the simple send and act version. But it has some benefits. If the, the actual outgoing message rate is quite low, then we usually don't get problems with writing out. So there will be very few negative acknowledgments. So we save a lot of message passing. And it's especially like this ping pong message passing can be sometimes quite harmful. And it also can be way more uh, performant when you have a lot of connections. We haven't yet proved this, but we are quite sure that this is the case. So that's it. That's for writing and back pressure. But we still have some problems. I skipped this thing in my intro slides, but error handling is even more problematic in the asynchronous case. You cannot just throw exceptions. Some other thread does something, and it's hard to propagate back the actual problem, and which thread should get it anyway. In Akka, we have a nice thing called supervision. Yeah, OK, nice. We can, in the supervisor, handle the problems, the exceptions, and restart or stop our actors. But what happens if we stop a listener actor and we have a connection actor responsible to sending messages to that actor? The connection leaks? It stays there forever? No. We have a wonderful tool in Akka called Deathwatch. Please raise your hand if you don't know about Deathwatch. So it's really a simple thing. You have two actors, and one says, OK, I want to watch that actor. And if that actor any, in any way fails and stops and ceases to exist, you get a notification that it has been terminated. That's it. That's Deathwatch about. It's, of course, more complex in the background. But f for user-level API, that's it. And if you remember this image, there was a nice link here, which now I emphasize more, that the channel actor actually watches the listener actor. This is very cool. If the listener actor in any way goes down with a failure and just disappears, then the channel actor gets immediately notified and it can close everything up. No need for explicit resource cleaning up. It just works naturally. And it works in the other direction, too. So if we actually happen to have a bug in Akka, or just as some other flaky thing happens, the listener can also watch the channel actor. So the channel goes away. It dies. It ends working. Then we can handle that. We are notified about that. So this is, again, a very nice um, thing that actors provide with us. And that's why actor-based APIs are so nice for uh, these kind of work. So, and as some final uh, addition, we all have seen now the lower layer groundwork, but we want to have some spice, some something, an abstraction layer that, that helps us designing things. And these are pipelines. Pipelines are simple, composable units of behavior which basically allows us to flexibly create protocol stacks and reuse layers of these stacks. This is how it looks like conceptually. Every pipeline works inside an actor. So actually a pipeline is single-threaded. But since it runs inside an actor, it's still concurrent with the other parts of the system. It just helps us to design these layers way effectively and more, in a more simple way, since we don't have to care about uh, synchronization problems and race conditions. So we can have like a little isolated, synchronous, single-threaded island, but we are still doing work on multiple threads. So you can think about pipelines as composable behavior for actors. So it's not the actors we compose together, but inside the actor, it's behavior. They are type safe, and f for that reason, they are very nicely reusable. Uh, we will see some examples. So, but let's look at this picture a bit uh, more. So, there are these pipeline stages, and what it they handle two kinds of 
messages or, or things that happen. One are called events, things that travel up the pipeline along the layers, and there are commands that go down. And as we see, every stage has four ports. There are ports for accepting lower layer events, ports for sending up events, and ports for accepting commands from above, and ports for sending commands below. So, if you want to have a pipeline stage, this is how you start. You define a class, it extends pipeline stage, which accepts uh, five types, and the first one is context, which we will not go uh, into depth to explain that. But basically, we just describe the types of the four ports. So, in this case, there is a type for the commands we want to accept from above, and a type for the commands we will be uh, sending below. And the same is for events. So the two kinds of ports, and they both have types. And these types help, uh, help us when we compose pipeline stages together. <coughs> type safety will help us. We cannot do this with uh, ordinary actors, but inside the actor with pipelines, it's possible. And this is how a pipeline stage looks like if you want to implement one. It's just a snippet, not the whole code, because that would be too long. But basically, it's very simple. You have two kinds of functions. In fact, there is a third one, but I omitted for, uh, uh, for simplicity. It's the common pipeline and the event pipeline, which basically, if we, when we get a command, we can produce something which could be, in this case, a command for the layer below. And if we receive an event, we might produce an event for the layer above. But it's not the only uh, case we can do. Uh, we can actually, uh, from a command, generate an event, and also vice versa, or a mixture of any of those, so we can push things up and down along layers. I know this is uh, a bit abstract, so I wanted just to show what is possible with pipelines. And this is just an assembly of several pipeline stages. So we basically use uh, um, a certain stack of protocols, uh, which is, starts with a string by string adapter, which has all of its above ports are strings, so it accepts and sends up strings, strings and it converts to byte strings below, which are basically an immutable abstraction of a byte chunk, byte uh, array chunk. And then we have this delimiter framing, which is another layer which does a very simple thing. It just gives some uh, special magic uh, pattern at the end of every frame it receives from above. And it does exactly the opposite from below. So in this example, we see a new line here. So basically, if messages come down, a new line character will be ad added, and the message uh, comes uh, up from below. It will be buffered until we uh, find the next uh, terminating character, and then we send it up again. And then there is this uh, adapter, which is a magical incantation here, which I don't really want to go into the deep of that, but um, I wanted to keep my code compiling, uh, kind of. And we have this nice thing here. It's a back pressure buffer. So you remember all that hassle with acknowledging, buffering, and especially with negative acknowledgements? So it's done for you. You can just inject this pipeline uh, stage into your pipeline. And it will handle buffering and back pressure, of course, up to a limit, which you specify as a maximum bytes. And there is this subtle point that any kind of back pressure is always contagious. So it's not enough to handle at one point. It has to go up until the point it's really ensured that you don't overload parts of your system. But in this case, this uh, buffer layer will notify you if the buffer gets below a certain watermark or gets above it, and then you can react on it. But if you stay below this range, then you are fine and you don't have to care about any kind of back pressure. And at the end, we give it a specific utility actor, which is actually um, a nice library tool, a TCP pipeline handler, who has the responsibility of executing a pipeline uh, inside it and communicate with a TCP connection actor. So, 
comments and questions, please store me with them. Yes? So I'm curious how the pipeline is different from net internal handlers. Okay, so pipelines in ACA are single threaded. They are absolutely synchronous and they uh, always uh, run in the context of an actor. In Netty, the pipeline is executed in one of the workable threads, uh, and uh, it's uh, not always thread safe to share pipeline stages here. Uh, here, pipelines are always isolated by an actor. They live on in, the, in that island, so uh, they can, uh, in principle, access a mutable state of the, even the actor, although it's not wise, but it's possible because the actor will serialize the incoming events in any case. What stage is like a shift to the attacker? I mean, like for HTTP, for instance. Is there anything? Pardon? For HTTP? So, so the net it comes with like a bunch of stuff. Yes. Like HTTP, stage handlers, and channel handlers. So what comes with that? OK, so I forgot to mention. So the ACAI layer is available in 2.2RC1, and it's in an experimental stage. And we already have a bunch of pipeline stages. As uh, we demonstrated, we have TLS, for example, which uh, was omitted here, and other kind of framing protocols. But we don't have, for example, an HTTP uh, pipeline stage for the very simple reason, since that's uh, what the spray team does. And we um, don't want to implement that, since it already exists if one wants to have an actor-based uh, HTTP server. But uh, it's quite easy to write uh, pipeline stages. It, um, like in a few hours, it's possible to write a new one. So we expect uh, the set of these stages to, to grow. <coughs> yes? In your, um, tell us about that in your selector handler, actor. Um, how do you pull the selector without the, uh, I, do you have like a thread that just runs constantly? Or, because um, obviously that's a, it's not a blocking. Um, yeah, so um, in selection handler, um, there is dedicated uh, stuff that deals with the blocking. So it's, it's not uh, any way exposed. I think there were some changes there. Originally, it was a pin dispatcher, if I remember, that was used with uh, um, the selection handler. And yeah, I don't... At the end, there's one, one thread that handles... Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for every protocol, there is only one thread that is uh, used for that. But um, it uh, it used to be configurable, if I remember well, the dispatcher for that. It still is. Okay, um, I, I don't really understand the, then the question. So you have a blocking API of a database server. So I'm, I guess, from your selection handle, you, you have a similar problem. Is that because okay, so how could you use that uh, for your? Uh, uh, um, so this depends on the fact that we have select available. And uh, Victor just waves me then. No, I, I'm just, I just want to cut in. Okay. So, so the question is how do you manage blocking and where do you do the blocking? Because like, as we're talking So what we do for the I.O. is that we keep uh, a thread <coughs> on the side that does the selection. Now, there are some blocks in an I.O. So like doing a time select can be buggy. And you don't want to deal with that. So, and you can do a select now. When you need like a loop order select now, that would just spike it at four. So what we do is that we do a non-time select, and then when that returns, we just submit to do it again. So submit to uh, use the after API or just set up the thread. No, no, to, to an execution context, basically. So it's like you run, and when you're done, run again. Yeah. Uh, but blocking is like when you do blocking, you can't, you can't, you can only push it so far. But somewhere that thing needs to block. So referring that to a controlled environment, like a, your own execution context, or um, using like a force pool and using 
nine-inch block unit, uh, that can sort of save you some data. But it needs to be a controlled environment. So two paragraphs. Okay, so um, I think we are out of time, if if I'm correct. So um, I want to say goodbye to anyone and happy hacking and let it crash. Thank <laughs> you.